in the British Museum, and we're looking at one of the caryatids from the Erechtheum from the Acropolis in Athens. Yes. <laughs> That's a lot of information. And a caryatid <laughs> is a human figure acting as a column. She looks like a column. She does. Her drapery falls in what almost looks like the fluting of a column, those vertical ridges. And because she stands in contrapposto with one weight-bearing leg, which is the one that looks like a column, and one free leg so mm -hmm. that the knee juts forward, that drapery is allowed to fall completely free of the body below. This very subtle and very sensitively handled sway to her body, right? The contrapposto mm -hmm. is not just in the legs, but even in the hips, which you can't actually see because of all the cloth, but which are referred to. You have this nice circular form around her hips. Where that the peplos kind of, just bunches. Right, that tunic that she's wearing and that pulls down around her waist, falling from her breasts in a, in a very graceful way. It's interesting because we were talking about the sway of the body, but by the time you get up to the capital, up to her head, she's straightened out, and she has to be. You know, you can really get a sense of the, even the specificity, the, the weight, the thickness of the cloth. You know, the way Peplos worked, it was pinned at the shoulders. But you can really get a sense that this is not a very thin fabric. It's got a, a certain heaviness kind of to, weight it. to it. It's interesting. If you look at the porch where this came from, there are six caryatids altogether, four facing forward, and the two on the right oppose the two on the left in terms of the contrapposto. I believe with the weight-bearing leg on the outside always to make it feel more stable. It's a sort of sensitivity to... Harmony, the, balance. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a nobility to her that is very much what we've been seeing when we also looked at the Parthenon sculptures. Again, we're in 5th century BC, Greece, the classical era, and that sense of ideal, perfect beauty and nobility and monumentality. But I also find it really interesting, this idea of conflating an architectural element with the human body, mm -hmm. because that's something that is a very ancient idea. And here it's done in the most sort of direct way. Later the Romans will um, will talk about architecture in terms of the human body, not only in terms of scale, but also in, uh, in terms of proportion. And here it's taken to the most literal extreme. And we're in the, within the same room is a fabulous ionic column, also from the Erechtheum, which is very graceful and grows more slender as it rises toward the top, with a lovely ionic capital with decorative carving underneath. But having this column here is a really important reminder of the scale of those buildings on the Acropolis, because when you're standing in the museum, you forget you know, the scale these of were. these buildings yeah. on top of a hill in Athens, and the way there's a nice skylight above it that gives you, begins to give you a sense of what it's like in natural light to see the stone. And this is, as you said, an ionic column, which is a much more slender, much more graceful right. column than the sort of heavy Doric, the massiveness that we see in the Parthenon, which is just across the way on the Acropolis. You know, sometimes, and I think this is a little sexist, but sometimes this order, the ionic, is referred to as a kind of more feminine. Right. Um, more elegant, more yeah. graceful, and, more decorative. And of course, the female figures are replacing the actual column, so there's this kind of synthesis of those two. And the lovely fluting that makes this, this wonderful play of light and dark across the column. Fluting, and, and unlike the Doric, there is a base. The column doesn't rise directly out of the stylobite. There is this sort of footing, and of course that beautiful scrolled capital. Mm -hmm. 